वी आर लाइव सर नमस्कार सुस्वागतम केम छो आदाबार्स गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का पी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टूडे इज द फिफ्टी फोर्थ व्याख्यान ऑफ द सेवेंटी फाइव एपिसोड सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान विच इज बींग ऑर्गनाइज एज ए पार्ट ऑफ पी आर एल सेवेंटी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ लेगेसी एंड हिस्ट्री इन फंडामेंटल फिजिक्स एंड स्पेस साइंसेस established in the year 1947 by the father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prl platinum jubilee coincides with india's 75 years of independence hence it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl kamri vyakhyan today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta with us Shri Kartik Sarabhai, who is the director of Center for Environment Education in Ahmedabad, he also has many other hats, which my colleague will be telling you once he will introduce our Vakhan Karta, Shri Kartik Bhai. He is going to speak on science and the challenges of climate change, which is also a very apt topic in today's relevance. We thank Dr. Kartik Sarabhai for accepting our invitation and to be with us on the celebrations of uh, the Pratim Jubilee of PRL as a part of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan and uh, also to the institute uh, which was established by his father Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. I would now request my colleague Prof. Pallam Raju to kindly introduce uh, Shri Kartik Bhai to our uh, panel at the webex as well as those who have joined us live on the youtube channel of prl over to you professor pallam raju thank you uh, professor bharadwaj it is actually indeed a great uh, pleasure and honor for me to introduce our speaker today shri kartik sarabhai uh, shri sarabhai is one of the world's leading environmental educators and a dedicated community builder uh, Mr. Kartike Sarabhai was educated in Cambridge, Tripos in Natural Sciences, and went on to do a postgraduate post uh, work in the development of communications at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, USA. He is the founder director of the Center for Environment Education, uh, which is established in 1984, which has its headquarters here in Ahmedabad with offices across India. Mr. Sarabhai's primary focus is on the greening of uh, India's formal education system, initiatives for biodiversity and climate change, and towards education for sustainable development. Towards this end, he had been uh, the uh, UNESCO Chair on Education for Sustainable Development and the Human Habitat from 2014 to 2018. He was a member of the UNESCO Reference Group for the United Nations Decade for Education and Sustainable Development from 2005 to 2014. He had been a member of the Advisory Council from, uh, of uh, Global Education Member uh, of the Advisory Council of uh, UNESCO, but that is from 2015 to 2018. He contributed to UNESCO's Education for All Global Monitoring Report uh, for the year 2016 through his uh, paper uh, entitled The Role of Education in Sustainable Development and Climate Change Mitigation. Uh, under his uh, guidance, uh, the CEE was uh, the national host institution for the UNDPGF Small Grants Program. He played a significant role working with UNESCO during the Decade uh, for Education and Sustainable Development Program and thereafter for the Global Action Plan on ESD. He has been a member of several committees uh, set up by the Government of India and other organizations in the fields of environment, wildlife protection and education. He is a member of the Departmental Advisory Board of the NCERT. He is a trustee of the Sabarmati Ashram Prevention and Memorial Trust, which manages the, uh, the conservation program of the Gandhi Ashram in Ahmedabad. He is the chair of the Earth Charter and the International Council. He is the chair of the regional hub of the monitoring and evaluating climate, communication, and education. 
He has long been associated with IUCN and was member of the chair of the South and Southeast Asia IUCN Commission on Education and Communication. He is a member of the uh, Communication, Education, Public Awareness Info Informal Advisory Committee of United Nations. And uh, he has, uh, under his able guidance, CE has partnered with UNEP to document sustainable handloom traditions in India. Along with this, a roadmap is being developed for textile cluster in Surat to promote sustainable growth of textile industries. His work in the fields of uh, environment and education has earned him numerous accolades and awards. In 2012, he was um, uh, honored with the Padma Shri by the Government of India. In the year 2013, the International Advita Advertising Association bestowed him with the Olive Green Crusader Award. In, to, in the year uh, 2016, he was the recipient of the International Brandwein Medal by the Brandwein Institute and the IUCN and CEC in recognition of his lifetime work for inspiring new generations to, ex of, uh, to experience, embrace, and love nature firsthand. With this brief introduction, I invite uh, Shri Kartike Sarabhai to deliver his Vyakhyan on the science and the challenges of climate change. Over to you, Shri Sarabhai. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bharadwaj, <clears throat> Dr. Palamraju, and uh, PRL, and all the people who are uh, listening to this uh, uh, broadcast of this Vyakhyan Mala today. This 75 years, and as you rightly said, PRL came up soon after uh, the independence, within, within the 100 days of that. And so we share in PRL the, the joy of, of coming somewhere and going, going further. Uh, the Prime Minister has, has called the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsa as a time to reflect on um, what we have done in the 75 years, but in some ways, more importantly, where do we go from here? Where does from 75 to 100? Where, what are the new challenges? What are the new uh, aspirations? And how are we going to meet it? And I thought in that light, it would be nice to talk about this relationship of science to policy, science to development, and in particular, this big challenge which is before us, which is, which is climate change. I'm going to just share uh, uh, my screen. Um, Are we all seeing this now? Yes. Yeah. It? yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I, I would like to start with a quotation from Dr. Sarabhai, where he, he consistently said that the development of a nation is intimately linked with the understanding and application of science and technology by its people. Now, this relationship, we can see it several times in his life, but, but the belief, and, and, and he doesn't say having good scientists alone. He said understanding of science and technology by its people. So he did see this as an essential process where the farmer understands the science, the, the, the common person in an urban area understands science, the person in the business understands science, so it, he saw it as, as a process where you take decisions which are based on science. And, and, and that whole scientific temperament really should go into our way of, of thinking. As we all know here, in so many instances, uh, Dr. Sarabhai saw that both the programs of the space and atomic energy and others were unique. In, in terms of it being at the frontiers of, of the, the technology, but at the same time, not just being imitative of what was happening in the West. Uh, the West had its own priorities and its own goals. And he saw that in India, we have to meet with the Indian challenges and actually demonstrate what could be done. This is a, just a photograph of the site experiment, which actually happened um, um, after his, his time, just after it, but which he had proposed. And it was, it was obvious here how some of this thinking uh, uh, permeated everything he did. I remember as a 18 year old or something, standing at the back in a Delhi room where, where this presentation was going. And many people were asking from 
information and broadcasting and others. What were these space people uh, doing in, in, in satellite, in education? Uh, today, of course, every child might tell you that point-to-point uh, -point communication, our telephones or our, uh, uh, our, our TV has something to do with, with the satellites and space. But in those days, it looked very strange how that how does science got to do with it? But what his belief was that science goes everywhere. Here, for instance, and how do you apply it to the Indian condition? Here, it was very obvious that we wanted to reach out through education to people where and villages where even a Paka road might not exist. And, and science and technology made it possible to do that. But it was in all other areas. Ahmedabad at that time was a, was a textile hub. And we had over 60 textile mills. Most people were employed in the textile sector. And he was looking at ways uh, in which you can bring modernization to it. You can, you can, uh, uh, you can, you can go and do research. And Atira was set up. I remember again as a, as a child, one of my first experience of going to Atira was to see a treadmill, uh, which I'd never seen in those days. It was not a common feature. And there was this man running in, in a very humid room, which was a simulation of a uh, 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 sort of textile factory. And in that simulation, what were the sort of conditions and things? And I was quite amazed to see how even in those human qualities, you were doing research. And this went down. In the pharmaceuticals, for instance, he set up uh, the operation research group at that time and uh, got the pharmaceutical industry all to be based on, on, on data, which they got, how you collect data, how you, how you authenticate it, how you see it without bias, all the things which you would apply otherwise to cosmic ray physics or, or, uh, or uh, high energy science through PRL and others. He also saw that they, that same type of application could be in various other, other sectors. One of the things where most of us have experienced this relationship was in this recent crisis, which we had with, uh, with, with COVID. Um, what happened was that it, it came so suddenly and we saw that it was, it was a crisis which, uh, which no one could find solutions. Initially, we were all grouping in the dark. But normally, a development of a vaccine or something like that takes several years, maybe 10 years, 12 years. And here was a challenge for science. And what was very interesting, you see on the right-hand corner, the various methods used to develop these vaccines. And, and the world came up with this challenge. You also saw the type of collaboration. We recently had Krishnaila come and speak at AMA last week in Ahmedabad. And he was saying how how that whole challenge of developing a vaccine in India, it was not only a matter of bringing it and, and manufacturing it here, but actually developing it using good science. Um, you had uh, Bharat Biotech collaborating again with Indian Council of Medical Research, National Institute of Virology. Here you see, for instance, that uh, there are several bits. Some are based on DNA, some are RNA, some are virus-like particles, some are non-replicating viral vectors. So, so the same method, but you could see the, the collaboration of, of, of people working together in, uh, in trying to bring this, uh, bring this about. Let's put it back one. Um, you also saw You also saw behavioral change. Normally, behavioral change is very difficult to do at such a large scale. But the fact that you had COVID, the fact that so many people died, I don't think there is probably any family in India who doesn't personally know someone who, who suffered in that second wave especially. We suffered a lot in the second, but in the first and second wave. And today, we, we feel much more confident if you see people around they said, yes, COVID might be there, but now we know how to treat it. Now we know how to deal with it. We've got the vaccines. We've taken two shots. Some have taken a booster shot, and we know how to do it. But what COVID did, it was like almost like a precursor for the way the world is going to go. It, it was a precursor where you had 
in a collapsed time of two years, you had this whole crisis emerge. You had global cooperation. Nobody thought of it as a cut. No country could singly solve it. You had behavioral change. You had some of the most modern science coming in. You had vaccination program. You had businesses coming in and all of them working together. Now, that's the type of work which we need to see increasingly in future. And I just want to talk about today some of the big environmental crises in front of our planet and the human race. One is, of course, the pollution uh, crisis. We have air pollution, we have effluent, and very, very large scale plastic pollution. And plastic pollution is not only on land, but in oceans, the way current trends are, it is predicted that um, there will be more plastic in the ocean than the total weight of fish and, and other animals in the ocean. And that's the quantity, the horrors of that. Uh, biodiversity loss is happening at an alarming rate. We lose something like a football field every 10, 20 minutes in Brazil. Uh, and, and not only does it create that smoke, but it, it destroys the biodiversity and a global heritage. But by far, the biggest crisis, I would still say, is the climate change. And, and unlike COVID, it is not something which will happen in two years and to solve it the second year. It is something which has been happening over the years. We've already reached an alarming state. There are dialogues and other things happening. And even if we change totally today, it's going to take a, it's the curve is much slower. So even if we do everything right today, it's going to take many years before the current uh, current amount of, of carbon uh, carbon dioxide or its equivalents are there to come down to uh, pre-industrial industrial levels. So this challenge, and how does it affect us? It affects us in a number of ways. It affects basically human health. There is health-related mortality. We've just seen, as I said, one here, but vectors move because the temperature changes. Uh, you have species and natural areas, water resources. Just imagine for a country like India, which is so dependent on its on the monsoon and, and, and fairly predictable monsoon, what it would be like if, if the monsoon changed dramatically or became totally unpredictable. It would be in complete chaos because so much of our, our lives are connected with the monsoon and then with the rivers which flow from the monsoon, the Himalayas, uh, not even talking about coastal areas and these problems. Agricultural crops, again, agricultural crops are things which are tuned into that environment in India, forest and forest consumption. So these are all very much tuned in with, with, the, with the climatic uh, conditions. There are various impact studies on India. This is one of them. But various types of modeling is required. And I think this is another area where science needs to come up because it's a very complex model. India has, as many of us know, one of the oldest data on Indian meteorological data. And, and in fact, one of the first papers on climate change came out of that data uh, many, many years ago. But the, what happens if, if temperatures goes above uh, two degrees? Uh, what happens if... Uh, if, if the extremes uh, change, what happens when, when monsoon uh, systemic, systemically goes down uh, to a certain extent? And, and how do, what, what impact does it have on crops, on livestock, on uh, what about diseases and everything else? Now, this is a huge area because it's not as if someone has come up with a perfect model. The models get better, but we need a model which works in India. And one of my points of today's talk is to, is to really say that we need to develop more research in India on climate change in all these sectors. Now, the model of what happens has to be very specifically Indian. It cannot, we cannot take a model from, say, Europe or America and say well, that we, we can plug in Indian data and have it because the processes are different and our cities are different, our people are different, their habits are different. How do we bring this in? The major issues in climate change one is, of course, mitigation. What do we as a country, soon to become the most populous country in the world, what do we as a 
there's one, uh, what is it, one sixth of mankind. How, how we live and what we do and how we do it is, is a major, major challenge. And there are a number of things here. The Solar Alliance, which our Prime Minister has taken the lead in with, with the Premier of France, uh, was, was is a major initiative. And I think if you, if you see what's happening in India at the rate at which solar power is going, the rate at which new policies are coming, where we can put it in our homes and sell back it to this um, wind energy and others. There are a number of things. The way we transport ourselves, do we use less energy? Uh, so there are a number of factors on mitigation. But we must remember, as I said a little while ago, that climate change, even if you do everything right, is not going to go away for several years, not in many of our lifetimes. So the whole problem of adaptation comes in, that whatever you do in mitigation, you also have to do equal number of research and equal number of innovative schemes to adapt ourselves. There will be more forest fires. There will be more floods. There will be more drought. There will be many other cyclones and other things. And interestingly, many of these things which we only used to associate with developing countries, if you see over the last year, some of the most developed countries are also witnessing these things and have no clue as to how to behave. In fact, the temperature in London went up to such an extent that they were looking up what they used to do in colonial times because they have no experience. Their buildings are not built that way. How do you deal with a London at 50 degrees or 45 degrees? Is, is very, their trees are not designed uh, for that temperature. So the, the, the rate at which it dries and the rate at which it burns is very different. So how do we adapt? So there's a whole research area on what we do, what adaptation strategies can be effective. Greening is one of the things which uh, is interestingly a simple solution, something which every one of us can do, and it has such a tremendous power in terms of both uh, uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. There is a nice, uh, in fact, a YouTube clip can, is also on that, where, where they take a log of wood and show it to Harvard students and say, where did this weight come from? You tap a log of wood and say, where is this from? And because of our, the way we think, we say that most of it came from the soil, what it had, it absorbed it and things. Very few people say that if 40% of that came from carbon captured from the, from the air, that from um, photosynthesis, you, you brought it and that's what, you're sequestering carbon, you're, you're storing carbon here. This is something which we all learn, but please try it when you, meet some students next, just ask them, show them a piece of wood and say, where did this, how much of this weight came from? And, and very few will be able to answer it. So as a result of it, we have taken up a campaign. This is a little photograph which has our CEE at one end and uh, PR at the other. Um, and you can see these two green patches and some others in between. But by and large, if you say, look at our city, it is very deficient in the amount of trees. So along with the Municipal Corporation of Ahmedabad and the Forest Department and the Biodiversity Board, CE has announced uh, as part of Azadi Ka Amrit Mausa, uh, a major Harit Ahmedabad, Haryalu Ahmedabad campaign. And we have seen this poster is available to anyone who wants it. It's a poster showing 75 trees. So just like your Vakya Mahala, we have also taken the number 75. Uh, we are all celebrating that number. Uh, as here are 75 trees, many of them, most of them are indigenous. Some are common trees like the Gulmohar, but which is not original, or did not originate in India, but is a common tree. And we are wanting every citizen, every institution to find and identify green spaces and really green them. PRL has done a marvelous job already, and I suppose day after tomorrow we are, we are going to add to that add to that greenery. But um, but greening is is something fantastic. It also saves the soil. It helps in a number of ways. It's one of those best simple remedies uh, for for climate change. In 2015, we had the very famous COP, which in Paris, where where uh, the final Paris Agreement got signed. And our Prime Minister was, was very keen that we bring out some of the Indian traditions 
Indian traditions which are climate friendly, uh, sustainable practices. We don't do it for that reason. We just do it naturally. But but that naturally, how do we how do we go forward? In Gujarat, for instance, if you have uh, rotis left over in the evening, one is one used to dehydrate it on a tawa, and it becomes a pump, becomes a khakra. Now then, of course, people like the khakra, so now we make khakras. But khakra was a way of recycling a roti so that it lasts lasts longer. Um, so so there are there's a number of practices here we've just brought out for the climate change department of uh, the Gujarat government a book like this on on India on on, Amdur, on Gujarat sorry practices in Gujarat. When I came back from Cambridge, um, uh, one of the first. Uh, assignments I got was from the Protein Food Association of India. So I didn't know what they wanted to promote. And they said that, do you know that three or four idlis with sambar and chutney gives you the same amount of protein as two glasses of milk? So I said, no, I'm sorry, I did not know that. And we want to popularize this. I said, fine. But I said, how come people didn't know it? So what they said was that Western research used to research rice separately and how much you absorb from that, dal separately or sambar, how much you absorb from that, chutney separately, how much you absorb from that, and add it. And A plus B plus C didn't give you all that much. Then someone had an idea, some Indian scientist, that suppose you test dal and um, idlis together and the fermented one. You know, fermented one. If you eat them together, what happens? Now, apparently at that time, what was explained to me was that the protein in the dal, in the lentil, gets better absorbed if you have it with rice or something. And if you have it with, with, with fermented rice, it's even better. So the conclusion of this research was that dal and rice should be eaten together. And of course, something which we know for 5,000 years, that we eat dal and rice together. The Mexican eats beans and rice together. But a scientist who does not know that and researches it separately, does not look at the synergy, will miss the point. And, the, and the, that, that's one of the points I want to say about, about research here. That when you research in India, you have to research it in situ, in practice. How do we behave in practice? Not taking every element separately and, and doing it. And, and that was something which was a fascinating lesson very way back uh, to me. Um, this is just a side, but many people when I go abroad say, do you use solar energy? Have you been using solar energy? And by solar energy, many of Indians also think solar energy means putting up these panels, and that is solar energy. I said, do you know that 99% of chilies in India or so many other things are dried using solar energy? Huh? This is Sida solar. It's not solar, does not have to come through a, a thing, because if I were to put a, a voltage cell right on my roof, bring down a wire and have a fancy machine to drive the chili, you'll say they've got solar energy used here. And these people will say they, they neglect it. So we must understand that many of our practices use some of this. We are a, we are a country which is, which is being given wonderful rainfall, wonderful sun, very good soil. And as long as we don't spoil it, it can, it can help. The whole population can live pretty well. If we, if we were to just respect, and the respect which we have shown over the years, right, from the Upanishads or Vedas onwards, we need to go back and understand how that respect uh, for uh, for environment has been. Many of the old practices are also getting modernized now. Uh, waste recycling is also very common. I mean, nobody throws away so many things in India. Traditionally, you will find just about in every home, you will find some recycled bottle uh, where you say, if it's a nice glass bottle, you get it. Nobody makes Even if you don't want it and don't have space, you give it to a kabadiwala who will then recycle it. The concept of waste, first of all, in nature doesn't exist. And I, I sometimes ask children, what is something which is completely missing in nature? And it is waste. Um, uh, there, is, there is no concept because everything, every waste from one becomes an input into another cycle. And there are all these cycles on cycles that there's no waste. But all these need to also be modernized. And one of the starting points of that has, of course, been segregating at source. Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation now keeps two 
in more sophisticated areas, you have you have uh, many many more uh, uh, segregation which is possible at source, and then of course it feeds into a system. So you see there's a photograph of electronic waste units. And we won't believe there's estimates of how many jobs India can create if, if we actually do a circular economy. If we take all the material we produce, we sort it out and reuse it, recycle it, upscale it, uh, uh, and do a number of different things with it, uh, we can we, we actually create create more jobs. And it's good for both the economy, for livelihoods, and obviously for the for the environment. We were approached by uh, OLX uh, some some time ago, saying that we feel that what we are doing in terms of exchange, uh, making it easy for people to sell some of their old things and buy new things, is is something which which is which is saving carbon. And can you do a study? So my colleagues did a study, came up with a very nice report that by extending the life of a product by, by X number of years, how much do you actually save? So what you are also finding in India is that very old traditions of, of exchange and give. We are now in a modern city. We don't have our cousin or younger brother there to give something to. Uh, but there are new forms of methods by which we can, we can do these things. Now, where does the research happen? Who, who does that research? Where does it happen? This is one way of looking at research. It's not totally way, obviously. It is to look at publishing. And if you see, there is certainly a change. 1989, 94, the right at the top, that little band at the top is India. And uh, the big one at the bottom is, is the US. And if you see, most of these countries are, are developed countries that includes China growing very rapidly. You can see the third, third uh, uh, thing on the bar is China. China started at the same size of India in the first bar. It has grown faster than India in the, in the last one. But India needs to also catch up here. So I think the argument today with my talk has also been that we need to do much more in climate change research. Now, climate change research is not confined to one type of laboratory or something else because it varies. Uh, one of the research, for instance, uh, done by uh, Dr. Ravindranath in, uh, and his colleagues in, in Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, it's the on, on this huge scheme of India, which is the Mahatma Gandhi Narega scheme, giving employment over 100 days to a number of people. And that scheme, many of its aspects are, in fact, related to climate change. So how much of that is happening? And they capture, the studies show that 102 million tons of carbon dioxide in that one year, 1718, when the study was done, through plantation and quality control, this is what that scheme could achieve. Now, normally, if I ask Manrega and climate change uh, uh, saving of carbon, people would not necessarily connect the two. But you must realize that they are connected as are so many other things. Another research is on uh, stress tolerant seed varieties. Indian Council of Agricultural Research uh, improved field crops. But what is happening is that India has so many different uh, climate conditions and weather conditions in the country itself that we have varieties like that. Even if you take cattle varieties, we have the, in Gujarat generally, you see the Kakrej in Ahmedabad, you will see the gear in Saurashtra, but you will see a slightly different cow in Kutch. So what is so great about that Kutch, Kutchy cow? First of all, it can deal without water maybe for two days because Kutch has never had a 10-year period without at least three to four years of drought. So the cows, are they are all used to grazing in the evening. They, there's a number of things. So they've bred over the, over the hundreds of years when you've had livestock. They've bred them into, there are India, I think, about 32 varieties of cattle. They are bred that way. Now, if you ask, if you see again, like that Idli example, that if you see cattle only in terms of milk, someone sees it only in terms of meat. Uh, in India, of course, there is a third product, which is the dung, and maybe urine as well. But, but the dung, the amount of things, I mean, I was trying to find a paper that uh, cows which are no longer... Uh, milk yielding, how can we make them from the dung at least be able to pay for themselves in a, say, a Pandrapur? 
you know, and there's how does that economic work? How do we, but there's hardly any, any work done on that, that area. The seed varieties is very important. We have so many varieties of, say, 300 varieties of uh, mangoes, we have uh, varieties of rice, just about everything. Uh, in Kerala, I was asking how many varieties of bananas. They're just, we are just fortunate. And we, we sometimes forget how, how grateful we should be to nature and you know, whatever your belief is uh, for, for what India has been endowed with. You know, it's not by chance that we have some of the oldest and biggest civilizations on, on, on this, this continent. Uh, but how do we do we know how to protect it? As some of you might know, we ran this this train. It was uh, an initiative of DST at that time. Uh, and we did it with the uh, Vikram Sarabhai Community Science Center and CE, uh, Science Express Climate Action Special. It went around teaching people on climate. This uh, image which you see is of the of the earth with a thermometer. And why that? Because it's very difficult to explain to children that if uh, global temperature goes up by one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius, why does it make such a difference? So I usually go to a class and say, how many of you have a fever? So of course, everyone raises their hands. Then I said, if you have uh, 102, and that we are talking about Fahrenheit, we are not even talking about Celsius. If you've got 102, 103, can you go to school? They said, no, no, we are completely sick. So I said, exactly. So when you talk about systemic temperature versus temperature, uh, ambient temperature around you, it has a very different impact. And then you can we take them through and show them how the last, uh, the, last the most uh, hottest years of the planet have been among the last uh, 10 years. We find at least six or seven of them have been record-breaking uh, heat. But then interestingly, people used to come only for an hour here because there was such a rush that you could not. You stand in line for an hour and they see some outdoor platform exhibits, then you go in, you see it. So we thought we should do some research on it. And we went to schools where there were two classes or more where one division went to see the train and the other division did. So we had a perfect uh, uh, control group uh, to work with because they are the same school, they have the same teacher, and one, one had exposed and one had not. And we did this work three or four months after the train had been visited. And on a climate change uh, questionnaire, we found 30% increase in, in, the, in the group which had visited the science train than those who had not. And it seemed extraordinary because we said, how can in one hour, how can they get this much? And then when we probed some more, we found that those who had gone into the train and come out, had followed that interest up with other activities in the class or in their home or in their reading. And that is why that effect happened. So sometimes some of these exhibits and things are triggers to start an inquiry. And I think this was an educational research, but all of this tells us how to have a better policy. We did another program on the Eastern coast, climate literacy and marine litter management in the entire coast from uh, Tamil Nadu all the way to West Bengal. And there again, as a result of this, uh, the awareness level went up by 62% among many people who are not necessarily even literate and it changed their behavior pattern. Uh, so India in research, we need more research as I showed you in that slide. Now, this long-term ecological observatory is one such initiative in India today. It's a multi-institutional, multidisciplinary, all India coordinated project led again by the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore and MOEF launched it. Uh, and it, it, it looks at different uh, baseline study of different, different areas and, and keeps, keeps them untouched and sees how they are behaving, how they change. Very much of this research it needs to come together somewhat like the COVID situation there is an establishment of the Indian Network for Climate Change Assessment, uh, INCCA. Many Indians are part of the IPCC, which is the global way in which science inputs into the global climate change discussions. So these are all methods by which good science will get back into, into, into decision making. Uh, we also in India, as many of you perhaps know, 
have 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 taken and made eight missions. So besides the ministries, because much of climate change is is uh, cross cutting, it needs uh, different inputs from different ministries. So they are doing it through this uh, mission uh, mode. There is the solar mission, which is which we all know about, and this is the little more difficult one: is the national mission on sustainable habitat. And interesting work is going on, including in Ahmedabad at SEP. Uh, for instance, I remember uh, Dr. Bharadwaj, uh, in very early days, Dr. Pisharati and I used to be, we used to discuss. And Pisharati was looking at what is the best white paint which will reflect the most amount of sun so that we will have cooling. And he was looking at, I remember from my memory, him putting in some aluminum components into that paint and to reflect. Today, there is a paint such available, but I remember that discussion at PRL as a young kid, how, how PRL was interested in this, or Dr. Ramnathan interested in what happens to water levels in Ahmedabad, and why are water levels falling? Uh, for instance, there is a whole issue of uh, what does the Sabarmati river front, the fact that on the entire river bed you've got water, how much impact does it have on the water ta table underwater table, and if not enough, how can we increase it? There are any number of research ideas for, for students who could come in. We have the National Mission on Sustaining the Himalayan Ecosystem, energy efficiency, again, a huge issue, uh, because just as much as you want to produce energy in a good way, you want to, um, you want to also conserve or the way the which we, uh, way which we use energy, and energy efficiency, but that is remarkable how the BEE marking today. I was asking someone at one of the shops here that when a customer comes to say buy a fridge, does this BEE marking make any difference to that decision? And they are saying absolutely. People are now become conscious enough that they want to see five star, three star. They ask sometimes how come a two door does not have this many stars? Why should I buy a one door? What should I do? That whole consciousness among people, the understanding of science, which Vikram spoke about, how do you get them to make daily decisions based on that? There is a national water mission, and there is a major activity being done on that. Uh, national mission on strategic knowledge, again, a research-based thing. Uh, Green India, we've spoken a little bit about it, and on sustainable agriculture. So we already have the infrastructure in India. The initiatives have been taken, but these can't be done by government alone. Research, young people who come and are doing their PhDs, young people are looking for career. This is a field which at least for the next 20, 30 years, there will be enough research to be done before we really understand how can we live in a world which is heating up and how can we prevent the world from heating up further. I, I used to do this, another word which you can used to like very much is the word leapfrog. And I was saying how, if in this chart, you think of sustainable on the right and, and developed and underdeveloped on the left, most traditional societies will be sustainable when, when they develop, they become unsustainable in the process because we imitate a lot of the West. Now, Western countries in turn are becoming sustainable and developed. So if you show this chart, and I've tried it, Mr. Bharadwa, Dr. Bharadwa, even at primary school, I said, what should we do if this is the situation? They all lift their hand and say, we should not imitate first, we should, and then retrofit, we should go straight to solutions which the West could not have done because they developed in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, when much of this knowledge was not there. We had developed, most of India's development till 2050 is yet to happen. When we founded uh, CEE in 84, everyone was saying, why do you want to go so away from Ahmedabad? Today, Thaltesh Tekra next to SG Road, I don't think anyone would say we are out of Ahmedabad. You know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the hubs of the city. But this leapfrog, so the United Nations in that year had a campaign called CO2 Kick the Habit. Now, I asked them, do you want us first to form the habit and then kick the habit? which is what those two triangles mean, or should we do something else? So only for India, we changed the campaign to CO2 pick right. What we said was that for us, the challenge is not to first imitate the West, 
then find the West has changed their method and then again follow them and do something else. We should be able to leapfrog the, the fossil fuel based wasteful development strategies and go to where other countries are heading in 2015. 2050. This even happened when we were talking about point to point communication using satellites. Because everyone's first question was America me hora? Now, America me ustarf nahi hora tha because there was so much investment in land based lines that they didn't want the satellite to replace all that heavy investment. In India, we did not have that investment. So we could straight away leapfrog into, into a mobile to a technology which used uh, use the satellite to do point-to-point -point communication. Uh, so, so in this process, we who are working in education say that it's not only the paradigm of development which has to change, but the paradigm of education has to be changed in fundamental ways. The new education policy reflects much of this. It reflects the fact that the child now does not have to be the storage of data. Your mind is now not to be completely a, a data bank because data banks is a Google away or, or something else away. We can get data we want. You need to be able to process that data. You need to be able to do critical thinking. You need to be able to take the data to solve a problem. So problem solving, critical thinking, having the confidence of thinking out of the box, all this is, is, is a must for, for, for the future. And this is what the tremendous transformation in education which has to be done for climate change and other environmental issues is, is that. Now the Prime Minister touched on something very important. There is a need for all of us to come together and take lifestyles for environment, we use the word life, forward as a campaign. What is needed is mindful and deliberate utilization instead of mindless and destructive consumption. Now, the word lifestyle has a very interesting history that when the first major United Nations Environment Conference happened in Rio, and I was a member of that Indian delegation, the senior Bush was the president of the US. And he had refused to come. And Maurice Strong and other bureaucrats who were in charge of organizing, and they say, without America, how can we have this conference? So they had to negotiate like everything else. In that negotiation, they had to say that, Bush had to say that, they you lifestyle ki baat nahi karna. Aap baat karo ke bhi how pollution can be controlled, how water can be produced. So pollution ki America was leaders in that. You can talk about that, but don't talk. American, we use the word American lifestyles are not up for negotiation. Now that wasteful lifestyles is today accepted as completely unsustainable. It's not a question of negotiation. So what India did, here is one example, for instance, there's a very interesting series of charts. What does a middle-class family eat in one week? Now, if you see that group of four from the US or somewhere, and this group of four Indians, they are not much different in weight. They're probably not much different in energy. But if you see the consumption, it's not actually consumption, it's the purchase. The consumption is probably similar, but the waste generated is huge. Everything comes in very much packed bottles. Everything comes in this. Should we, for instance, in our uh, in our cities, uh, we are we are we have the luxury of something coming in a handcart near your society. You can walk out of your your kitchen, and within uh, twenty feet, you will find a handcart which doesn't sell everything you need. But at least all the main essentials, you don't use transport. He is not using air conditioning, not using anything, and you can get it. Now, do we therefore modernize these, these things which are inherent in India, or do we discard them because there are no handcarts in New York? Uh, so this is the this is the dilemma which I said about the confidence of, of that. So so as a result of India, finally in 95. That's a photo of the 192 countries which signed the Paris Accord. Um, they, they managed to put in this word for the first time, also recognizing that sustainable lifestyles and sustainable consumption, paths of consumption and production with developed country parties taking an important role 
in addressing climate change. So at least that thought has now gone in that we have to change. We cannot have the type of lifestyle because the planet cannot afford it. And that's another talk on whether how we change it. But, but that is something which we managed to get. So again, ending with, with something Vikram Bhai said, countries have to provide for, again, for research, facilities for its national to do front-ranking research within the resources available, very conscious of the resources. It is equally necessary having produced the men and women who can do research to organize task-oriented projects for the nation's practical problems. The eight task forces are in a sense that they are task-oriented groups. They are not bound by, uh, by the verticals of discipline, but they are there to, to, to take problems. There is very few problems. If we were to apply our minds, we have some of the best minds, best scientists. We have to give them the resources. We have to give them the backing. But taking one after another policy decisions which are not based on, on reconfirmation or, or bringing scientific, if we were to bring them in, our policies will become that much more effective, that much more based on, on data, and we will be able to solve that as much as we are able to solve in a large way the, the COVID uh, situation. I wanted to end again by, by showing you this. Uh, we were doing this work in Hyderabad in 2005, and that was uh, with 10-year-old girls. This was from a St. Mary's school in Hyderabad. And, and uh, you know, we talk about the footprint. It's been developed well, and it's calculated. You can calculate the footprint of an institution, of an individual, of a nation. Basically, it is to do with how much you consume. So she put this hand. It's the hand of this girl, Shrija. Uh, I said, what is this? Our colleague asked. And they said, this is the handprint. What is handprint? Handprint means we can do what We have got energy. We are not only based on our footprint. So, hey, anyone wants to live on the planet, we'll have a footprint. We can decrease that footprint. So decrease your footprint, but increase your handprint. Each one of us can go ahead in the next week, we can plant a tree. We can, we can save, we can waste less, we can segregate. There are a number of things we can do at the individual level. But there are many more things, Dr. Bhardwaj, you and other scientists like yourself uh, can do for, for this transformation which India, India requires. So thank you very much uh, uh, for this opportunity to share some of my uh, ideas. Huh? <clears throat> thank you, uh, Sikartike Bhai, for, for this fascinating lecture. And maybe you know you're, you're sharing your thoughts with a lot of experience with being in various committees in the international fora. And also you talked about various uh, mitigation strategies that can be used and the, the nature that has provided uh, so many things and how well we can, how well these you know are intercoupled. In fact, the examples that you gave in terms of where to look at the system, you know, that the idli and sambar you know, combination okay. is a very interesting thing actually, in the sense that, that we have been doing in the past without knowing uh, and knowing the, the scientific research, probably I think our various systems were such that they were uh, inherently scientific without the proofs and uh, and uh, and and then the uh, uh, calculations. It has been very fascinating, and also the last slide you said it decrease your footprint and increase your you know uh, handprint. That's handprint. Wonderful. wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Uh, and and I should say that it has gone global. The handprint concept has gone global. If you say, is there a single concept which started in India, that too in a school with 10-year-olds, and which if you go to the, the GIZ German site, you will find the handprint there. Oh. The same handprint of that same little girl, Srija. It's oh. gone. They wanted to come to actually photograph it. So these children who were doing it. Their parents said, no, so we couldn't do it. But it is global, so the power of an idea Yes. That we don't only think footprint, footprint, think handprint also. Okay, we can all do something. And this is one area which you don't have to leave only to scientists or, or policymakers or, or big businessmen. Every one of us can contribute to this global transformation. It's not only for India, but India has to find its own unique ways. And yes. India will provide the leadership. That was the point. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, on that, on that account, congratulations to you to start the Handprint, you know, it has gone global. Yeah, <laughs> it was, it was very nice. <laughs> and now, okay, I'm sure there will be some, you know, uh, 
questions uh, from our audience. I will now invite my colleague, uh, Professor Lokesh Sahu, to, to, to conduct the question answer session. Lokesh. Thank yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for a very nice talk and uh, leadership presentation on science and challenges of climate change and also highlighting the importance and application of science and technology towards the promotion of education, awareness on issues like climate change and environment, and more importantly, on the understanding and better use of our own resources available in the country. Now we have colleagues joined through the, the WebEx also, and also the YouTube. So uh, our colleagues will be posting the questions, which is some if some questions are there in YouTube, and then I'll go through it. So meanwhile, I, I invite colleagues who have joined in WebEx to raise their hands and uh, interact with uh, Karthik AJ. So I invite for the interaction. There's only hand raised a little Yes, yes. Uh, Professor Bhadwaj, please. Thank you, Lokesh, and thank you, Karthik Bhai, for an excellent talk. It is always a reminder to everyone that we had to keep doing something or other as much as possible and to contribute uh, to mitigate the climate changes which is happening. And also, you know, to see that uh, India should uh, look at the climate change much differently than what is being looked up by the Western countries. Mm -hmm. And you gave ample examples of that uh, in your talk uh, that the way we used to deal with the things when we don't have refrigerators or we don't have uh, many of these modern appliances which is available now, including air conditioning, for example. And, right. and we were all much better off compared to what we are having now. And uh, that also reminds us that, you know, the packaging, which uh, you also uh, stressed upon, Packaging of food uh, is becoming a is a fashion actually, which uh, which needs to be tackled in a slightly different ways than is being tackled in the world all around. Uh, that is one area which I found uh, uh, India should come out in a slightly different way with uh, respect to food packaging, uh, which never used to be earlier in our olden days. I have never seen food package, you know, uh, for uh, uh, for eating, whereas now it has become a habit kind of thing. And and our youngsters are are picking up these things like anything. Uh, so one of that is uh, one of the areas in which I think we should as Indians look at this as a serious issue where packaging of food also give rise to a lot of wastages as well as uh, to changes which comes because of uh, you need to preserve it once you have to do the packaging. And the second thing which uh, you mentioned about, you know, the idli wala and we still remember that we used to think about dal, chawal, roti and sabji is the full diet, <laughs> right? And uh, we don't, and uh, you can add card or your dahi, you know, to that and becomes a complete uh, diet for us. Uh, and we don't have to take anything. So my question to you is that I think we had to think about uh, food packaging in a very different sense compared to what is being prevalent now. What is your take on this? No, well, absolutely. This, uh, I mean, when I was young, if you go to a station in the south, you would have curd rice in a in a banana leaf. You know, it would be packed in a banana leaf. There's everything is biodegradable fresh, there'll be a little pickle in it and something else. Every station, and again, something which Vikram knew very much about. Uh, SR Thakur used to tell me that he knew what was best available at which station, because that time they were traveling by a train. But all that food came in a packaging which itself was was degradable, you know? Uh, and then suddenly changed. Even the peanuts which you get now, instead of the paper wrapping, they put it in a plastic bag. So not only is the plastic bag, but you'll have two um, staples are there. And if you're not careful, you will you will have a staple in your mouth. You know, so, so packaging is a major thing. Now, what they've done is, again, this couple of slides which I showed, how the old cannot just be adapted, just be saying that I like that and let me do it. Because there are many issues. 
which are there, which is why people so. So people want it in some way. So they have found ways in which from that same leaves, same leaves, but you can now compress them in such a way that you can uh, uh, you can uh, reuse them and other things. But they are the same leaves that we used to use when we when we stitched the leaves together to make a thali. You know, but you don't have to stitch it, you do it. Now, unfortunately, some of them, to make them waterproof, still put a plastic layer in between, which defeats the defeats the purpose. But if we say that we want to put something which will work, then our scientists are completely capable of finding what will work. I should just tell you one small story of um, so when we started CE, one of the early things was that the uh, the chula which they used in villages gave a sort of uh, um, buoy in the in the in the room, which was very bad for the women. So there was a whole movement to have this nirdum chulas, you know, with with a little chimney and other things. And the scientists had divide developed this chula, which would focus the the heat in the middle, so there would be no wastage. You know, normally if you put a pad. The food that you can see the flames going on the side, which is just wasted energy. But it was not working. So this group asked CE us to go and investigate. Ki, kya, kya, kyo, nahi chal hai. Now the women said that in India we like our bread, our rutla, crisp on the side. Or you know, some science, some beach mein, eat calorific value was the same. But was kuch men scientists take care of the lab mein, uh, not understanding a cookie by Kasakana, so they wanted it on the side, heat on the side. So women came sideways, they started making holes on the side. Uh, so when they made holes on the side, that new machine was much worse than the only than what they had in terms of fuel consumption. So to some extent, when we do research, we must also find out what the situation is. You know, we also sometimes do it exactly like the Western thing. Uh, Maybe we are in India, but in our research methodologies are all learned from somewhere else. So we should also question some of our methodologies. How do we how do we do these so these things, and what is the essence of what is the essence of of that? So I think uh, packaging, as you say, is a huge thing. We have got many materials and many natural materials. I think the only there is no way out of packaging because today mail order, this and that, etc., is, is a reality. So packaging, which is biodegradable, is a must. Now, of course, there are new chemistries, chemists are inventing substances which are like that. You can also look at natural substances, but there's a whole research in terms of how to make something biodegradable. And I think that's a, that's a opens up an area. I mean, in fact, there should be a center for packaging uh, somewhere, you know, uh, which just does research in, in packaging. I totally agree with you. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, Kartik Bhai. I think that is a good idea that I think we should also do some research locally uh, with materials available within the country because India is such a vast country. Exactly. So the resources available from east to west, to north to south. And uh, we should utilize our own resources to do the packaging rather than yes. just replicating what is done in the western countries no we are again trying to find some poly uh, uh, some molecule which will be better and which will do it in a thinner way but we are not asking ourselves okay can i use some natural substances in india which can have the same uh, protective quality they're non-toxic and uh and, and can can be used for packaging no? i mean this is one area i would say any number if there are students who are watching this then I would say that there are lots of PhDs available in, in packaging of what you said. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So I am not able to see some other hands. So I again invite colleagues to interact with uh, Dr. Saravai. Yes. You know, uh, Mr. Bharadwaj, while you're looking, Mr. Bharadwaj spoke about uh, cooling. You know, you're saying about how we used to cool and how we used to do without fridge. But even heating, so when we were writing that Parampara book, one of our team had gone to Kashmir. And there we found that the houses are so constructed that on the, on the first, on the ground floor type of thing, 
would be where the sitting room was. But underneath there was the was the cattle shed. So all the goats and sheep would, would be put underneath. So he asked me, Why are you doing this? He heat, the heat which is generated all, all the time when these goats are there, that keeps our floor absolutely warm even in winter. Now see these, these small techniques of, of not letting energy go waste. You know, so as, as you were saying that we did manage, but we need to modernize some of these things because people will not expect, I mean, you cannot give a solution to people that you keep goat under your, under your thing, but we can find out where is wastage energy happening, where is waste water being generated, can we, uh, can we have a dual water system so we can use waste water, so all these things are possible. So if there are no questions, I think so, they can even later if someone yeah, has so, a question. Yeah, right there, there, there is a question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah Professor, please go ahead. Uh, no, no, I think when uh, you know, she, Sarabhai mentioned about the the shade, shade, shade and goats, you know, staying at a normal, uh, nice temperature, I was, uh, you know, reminded of, uh, you know, in the earlier uh, times when water was being boiled for, you know, for bathing and all the boilers, I, I noted that, you know, the elderly ladies, you know, they used to put metal uh, you know glasses in the in the big vessel because they themselves these uh, these glasses you know metal glasses become secondary radiators and keep the water warmer for longer time actually so these are several practices which were being done were were really you know uh, thought of and, and innovative and in situ solutions uh, in situ solutions to that to the to, uh, to the existing you know problems you know people used to in those directions, let's say. I just wanted to. Yeah. With you. yeah. And uh, Mr. Gulamra, one of the sad things is sometimes that we will we will not recognize one of our practices. Now, of course, yoga is is very well practiced and it's been promoted by the current prime minister and others. But there was a time when yoga was seen as some some old backward thing. And only when you get someone like the Beatles coming in and started doing yoga, then everyone wakes up saying, wow, they are recognizing this, so it must be good. You know, I mean, yeah. that mentality continues in a, in a lot of lot of things. And we somehow need foreign uh, endorsement uh, for for something which is, which is good. Uh, but if you follow something like the idea which you said, uh, how do I conserve energy? That might be, might be something in it, you know, and, and look at it. And I think probably in that, continuing on that particular aspect, I think in terms of patenting also, we have lost in terms of turmeric or, or the yes, rice exactly. and all. So probably uh, we... So, so another we thing Dr. which is required uh, is, is to make the patenting process easy and explain to students how to patent an idea. You know, I mean, people don't know how, how do you go about it and things. They might invent something, but they don't go and then they lose out. So I think... Uh, somewhere in our education system, uh, especially in innovative areas, people need to be told how to go about uh, patenting it. Now. Yeah. So again, thank you. Huh? So, th sir. So, I have a question here. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you are allowed. Uh, so, uh, related to environmental change and climate change, uh, we understand that there is a mitigation and an adaptation. So, uh, can you highlight the, what are the differences and what we understand, what is mitigation and what is adaptation? And what are the key challenges in terms of uh, mitigation and adaptation, which we are facing in particular way related to implementation of various important national programs? Well, very briefly, I, mean, I, I did touch on this in my talk, yeah. but the basic point is that mitigation means that you want to prevent climate change happening. That is, that is the mitigation. So you want to take steps, for instance, one of the biggest ones is fossil fuels. If you burn fossil fuels, there's no way the carbon dioxide is not generated because most of them are carbon-based. Uh, fossil fuels are all carbon-based, and then you release them. Uh, sequesting is when, when the trees absorb this thing, and, and therefore they, the net total output net output of the planet is the output minus the sequestering. Uh, in fact, uh, how much sequestering happens in the ocean 
was done by Dr. Sareen in PRNS. Uh, he, he had a nice, uh, nice research on the sequestering ability of the, of the ocean. And today, what I would like to find out, okay, whatever the Dr. Sareen's research findings were, today that the oceans are much more polluted with plastic, has the sequestering ability gone down or is it the same? And, and what can we do to, to I'm mean, just telling you the way the research will still need to be, it, but this was a PRL research. Uh, adaptation is recognizing the fact that the impact of what has happened, the fact that we are we have already released uh, the amount of carbon dioxide over the last, since, well, since industrial revolution, we've been starting to do that. And with our population, uh, I mean, it used to take number second to third million population took somewhere 130 years or so. Now it takes 13 years and we are doubling, we are increasing the population at that rate. Hopefully it will, it will taper off, but it is going on. So, so with that uh, problem, uh, we cannot impact something immediate. It's not like a switch. When you turn the switch off and the light will close. It is like saying that I turn the switch off and uh, three days later the light will close. So suppose you were living like that. Or like let's say you were an inefficient water heater at your home. Huh? So if you were to turn on the switch when you want a bath, you can't do it. You know, you have to remember much earlier and turn it on because it takes a time. Now the climate change time taken is, is much longer. It's like 10, 15 years before the molecules you are relating now will start having an impact. So, ab, ab karengi, uski effect saal ke baad right? so, in the meanwhile, things will get worse. It won't get better. So, during that period, what am I going to do? Whatever I do now, suppose I'm going to get a, a floods will happen. Suppose my I'm living in a Western country, I'm going to get heat. So, I will have to do something. Now, in Ahmedabad, for instance, one of the initiatives, again, going back to that Dr. Pisharati issue, uh, there is a major initiative of, of taking white painting all the roofs. This is just one initiative. And, and, and Paragaji, you know, at Science Center, we've kept just one square, which is white, and one square, which is black. And any child can just put their hand and see in one way it burns, and the other one is cool. You know, it's, it's a simple science. Every Indian who goes to school, even one year, should know the difference between reflectivity of white and and why is black black? Because it absorbs. That's why its color is that. I mean, it's not a color. It's basically it's absorbing all the colors. So, so, so this is this is what it is. And therefore, the adaptation strategies are very local. Mitigation is something which is global, because up you are carrying it will also benefit someone. What they do will benefit you. But adaptation you have to do. If I'm in a fisherman village, or I'm living in uh, say Maldives or somewhere. My uh, suppose the, with the sea level rise, even by a few inches, all you know, my island is going to become half the size. Now, just think that when if if we have a, uh, any aggression in our border, border with your aggression, isn't it? We fight, we have a army, we have a inch, we have to do it. We have climate change. How much of India, how much land will India lose if the temperature goes up by four degrees? So why are you not bothered so much with that? You should be as bothered as you are for the for uh, Himalayan borders and all that, right? So we should be as bothered as concerned. But I have to do something for that. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So thank you, sir. We have uh, one more colleague who is uh, interested to interact with you. I invite uh, Professor Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. I I, I have a question uh, or probably your comment on this long-term ecological research uh, thing which you said being led by ISC. And see, that kind of a research is very important, particularly as you said that any change in ecosystem uh, due to the climate change takes a very long time, say 10 to 15 years at least minimum. Otherwise, you get a very different or a probably wrong result if you probably set for after two to three years down the line. So the question is like to establish such a laboratory, for example, you need vast amount of land. I mean, uh, 
particularly even in Gujarat, for example, if we have one in Saputara or one in Ram of Kutch or in any other area, agricultural fields, for example, how to go about it? Like how to kind of project to the government, for example, if you have an idea, because being in the committees and all, how do you project to such kind of a laboratory? It's like you require vast amount of land with many stations. I can do that in any, uh, say, any forested ecosystem, go and have my instruments placed, but probably by next day it will be gone. It will be, you know, someone will take it from there. So I, I don't know. I mean, it's a very important research which needs to be done, but how to go about it remains kind of a mystery in Indian setting. But I will tell you, uh, first of all, you have to take the local people with you in that research. You know, they have to feel a stake in that, that thing. In Bangalore, I was just listening to a lecture on someone who is putting probes in fields to look at moisture levels. So what they've done is that the probe is there, the probe jet, uh, sends a signal to a tower and the tower sends it to a source from a central location. They know that if the moisture level falls below a certain amount, then water is released. So in the, in the agricultural field, so that the plant uh, production capacity is going up rapidly. Now, because they've taken the farmer into confidence, they are they are able to uh, uh, appreciate that and do it. You know, so they have to be part of that part of that study. You have to put the probes somewhere where it can be done. There are many many examples of uh, of that. Initially, again talking about PRL, you know, the whole question: Kya balloon jab jayega when it lands into someone's field? Wo wapis milega ke nahi milega? Mm -hmm. that, that used to be one of the PRL questions in in, in, in earlier times. So. So these are things we have to follow, but Indian public on the whole is very cooperative. And, and you know that example of the church which was used in Tuba, yeah. that the story is Abdul Kalam used to often tell us, how when you take people into confidence rather than treat them as someone else, they, they always live up to that. So India may to especially in rural areas. Urban areas may thoda kuch difficult. In rural areas it is there. Yeah. Uh, there was a there's a question on the sidebar. Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Day, do you think the Indian population is more suited for adaptation due to higher threshold of susceptibility or immune power? I think um, uh, Indian population is more suited for adaptation because we are reaching so many situations where we have to adapt. You know, our ideal situation is not. So if 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 someone were to announce that kal pani uh, baje se pa pani aane wala nahi hai. Huh? So there will be nobody who will, sab log ek dol leke bar denge pani. Huh? Because we, we have lived through these situations. Aaj ye nahi hone wala to kya karna hai, to we know. In the West, what happens is that because they've never, someone has never lived without an electricity, never lived without flowing water, never lived without something, so kya karenge, they don't know what to do. So Indians, not for because they're more sensitive, and then we also do jugaad of all sorts of nature. So we 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 as a as a as a, as a group of people uh, can do some of these things much better because we all live under conditions. Our our environment is not a very this thing. And uh, you know, uh, I mean, people are saying there are some uh, viruses which come. And they say, why is it not effect not this COVID, but another virus? I was asking, why is it not affecting everyone? So we'll say, yeah, it's not the virus, so the virus is not attacking them. So that's why the virus has no chance, no space to do the work. So, you know, we are living in a very different uh, uh, environment. Now, there, what they're doing, they sterilize the environment so much. You know, if you always give a sterilized food, you don't develop the gut bacteria in the way it should. So then you will eat anything which is outside that that limit, you will fall uh, fall sick. So that any. Uh. So uh, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you for giving your valuable time for the the Amrit Vakyan as well as uh, uh, to our audiences for interacting interactive sessions. Now we have con come to the end of uh, question answer session. Now I invite uh, our colleague. Uh, Dr. Bhusit Krasno, for word of thanks and concluding Dr. Bhusit. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lakesh, uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to thank our today's uh, Vakyan Karta, uh, Shri Kartike Sarabhai ji. Uh, we are also at the, you know, juncture of uh, the 103rd uh, birth anniversary of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai. 
because of whom we are able to celebrate 75 years of PRL. We remember him on this uh, occasion and uh, we, you know, convey our wishes to the family of Sarabhai uh, as 12th August is just approaching. Uh, with this, we also thank uh, Sri Kartikei Bhai uh, for sparing his valuable time and giving this very interesting and informative talk today. And uh, all his, uh, you know, office staff for coordinating uh, with PRL for today's talk. Uh, we thank our director and dean for their constant encouragement uh, for conti uh, continuing this activity, Vyakhyan activity. Uh, thanks to the entire Vyakhyan committee for their various support uh, time to time. And last but not the least, thanks to all the WebEx viewers as well as YouTube viewers for joining with us every Wednesday. And we keep, uh, you know, requesting you that please do join us every Wednesday at 4 o'clock for uh, interesting talks. Thank you and uh, wishing you a very happy Independence Day as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wishing you all. Thank you. Thank you.